There's nothing in marriage we've learned that you need to, that you should leave for chance. Yeah. Right. There's nothing you should take for granted. There's nothing that you should just leave to chance. Mm -hmm. And if there's anything you shouldn't be guessing about, mm -hmm. <laughs> it is your sexual intimacy. Right. And so you're listening to Get Your Marriage On, the fun and spicy podcast, bringing you new tools and fresh ideas so that you can be the sexiest couple you know. Ah, oh, communication in marriage. It's so important and also a source of frustration in our most important relationships. We don't always know how to talk and more importantly, listen to one another, especially when our emotions run high. Learning to talk about intimacy in marriage is also a skill we can all develop and do a little bit better at. Today, my guest is Denise and Oliver Marcel. They, are, they mentor couples on improving their communication skills for deeper intimacy and connection. And they've been married for 20 years and have three children. Denise and Oliver, it is such an honor and a pleasure to have you on the podcast today. Thanks oh, for joining wow. me. Thank Man, you. It's, it's we're our pleasure. To yeah, be here. We're, excited we're excited about this conversation. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, I love your message and I love what you're teaching couples and what you want to do. And one of the things that... Uh, I was curious about is in your own marriage, have you ever had times where you felt like you weren't communicating right? And what was that like? Man, yeah, uh, we, how, how long is this interview, Dan? <laughs> <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> it's five hours long. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. You, you want to, I'll, I'll let you go. Yeah. First. We've had a few, one, one instance in particular that I can remember is um, the time when we were going through something really, really difficult with one of our children. Mm -hmm. Do you remember yep. that? Yep. And um, it was just really a really challenging time for our child in particular. And as a result, we felt helpless because we couldn't really help our child. And I felt like at the time that I was the one that was doing all of the assistance with our child. And I was the one that was doing all of the support for our child. And there was not really much interaction as far as I could see from Oliver. And it was really, really bothering me. Like I felt like I was taking the whole brunt of this whole really difficult situation. And this wasn't just over a couple days here and there. This went on for months. We were in a mm -hmm. really, really difficult dark place. And, um, I found out later on after things kind of lightened up and almost uh -huh. resolved and things weren't as terrible and we were able to actually breathe from that situation. I found out that all it wasn't that he wasn't in, he wasn't being intentional in like, I, I don't even want to be bothered with that. I'll let you handle it. It was that he was handling it in a completely different way. He's a man and he felt like, man, I can't do anything to help my family. And he told me there were often days where he would go to work and in order to get himself together to go to work and be this work guy, he would have to sit uh -huh. in his car and get himself together for like a good hour. And so he was just handling it in a different way. And so... I felt like he wasn't communicating with me and to a point he wasn't, but it was uh -huh. because he was just handling the situation in a completely different way than I was. And I felt yeah. like he was just not wanting to be involved at all when that was oh, gotcha. the case. Yeah. yeah. And, and what's weird about that, Dan, is that by nature, and, and this, this will probably come up in the conversation later, but by nature, I am what we call a shotgun communicator. Yeah. Right. So uh -huh. I'm that person who, if something's happening at noon at 12 or one, I'm barking about it. And, and typically she is the procrastinator or the processor in, in that, in, mm -hmm. in, in most of these scenarios with us. But in that particular uh -huh. scenario that she talked about, it, it kind of flipped. Mm -hmm. She was doing a lot of the upfront stuff as it relates to communicating. And I was processing because I didn't have the solution the solution yeah and so right. kind of as that deliberator i'm like man i don't know what to contribute i don't know if i can contribute let me just try to get my head together and so and that it translated into me not saying much mm -hmm. you know and, and not communicating in that way but as a result from that from me learning what was going on 
you know, I think we both now realize that, you know, understandably, we may handle a situation differently, but we have to remember to communicate more effectively, even if Oliver were to have come to me and said, you know, I'm, I'm really having a challenge, you know, working this out. It's not that I don't want to be involved, just so you know, but I'm just trying to figure things out. So don't think that I'm trying to be hands off. And so now we've come to the point where we know that we have to do that up front. Right. If that's how we're going to, if that's how it, it plays out. I might not have it all, but I at least need to involve her in the process. Yeah. At least communicate enough to say, hey, I don't have it all. Right. So here's what I have. Here's what I don't have, as opposed to just holding it all in. Right. Yeah, because it looks like you're just closed off. Right. Right. But in reality, you're actively processing. But you need to. I love that you figured that out from that experience. And you're like, this is like uh, next time this happens. I'm going to do this better. Right. So now you have like a playbook now like right. to, to get through all the other things. Yep. 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 Exactly. That's, that's, exactly, great. that's exactly what happened too. We, <clears throat> we, li- we literally had a conversation. Okay. In future scenarios, what do you need from me as it relates to communication? Yeah. Okay. Well, I need for you to at least tell me what's happening. Yeah. Even if nothing is happening or what you want to happen isn't happening, just say that. Yeah. So we have something to work off of. Right. Mm-hmm. Did that conversation uh, come across as an like a did it begin with an argument and that was a resolution or actually, how, how do you have those conversations it actually, calmly? Yeah, that's good. This particular situation did not begin in an argument. It, I was very upset actually because I felt bad about how I was treating him because I felt like he wa- didn't want to be involved and then. Once I knew what the real story was, of course, the compassion was there. So this particular instance did not begin in like a disagreement or conflict or an argument. Yeah, as I as I remember, I think because because the time had passed. Mm-hmm. So what what sometimes happens with us is that you may have we may have the moment of frustration, but don't necessarily have the heart to heart until after that moment is passed. Right. Yes. And so we we don't necessarily come back to it. Now, that's not every time. We don't necessarily come back to it with that same level of frustration that we had before. Right. Yeah. You mentioned the shotgun and the procrastinator. What are some other ways people communicate? Man, some some of the- Or don't communicate. Yeah, (laughs) you're right. Well, there's one, the silence, the the, (laughs) non-communicator. We, Which is a form of communication, isn't it? It is. It is a form. Because uh, you're saying something by not saying something. You got That's it. That's right. You got it. Because yeah. you might not be saying words, but there's actions. There's there's uh, nonverbal stuff. There's facial expressions. There's all of those different things. Some of the others that we, we talk about often are the non-confrontational or what I call the yes, dear person <laughs> uh-huh. who, who just, you know, just doesn't want to cause any ripples, you know? And so as a result, they may not say what they really want to say or Mm -hmm. communicate what they really want to convey. They just kind of go along with what's happening. Uh, Another, another one that we talk about often is the hoarder. So if Mm -hmm. you think about the show hoarders, Uh same concept where you just have, you just taking all this stuff in and just hoarding it and never getting to a place where, Yeah. yeah, where you're letting that out. And often as you know, with the show hoarder, somebody's got to come in and get that stuff yeah. <laughs> and, t- yeah. and take it from you. And so those are those are at least four that we talk about quite often. Mm-hmm. So what like what do you do in a situation where you walk in and you, just from the cues of just the vibe you get from someone? Because I, I believe we are always um, I, it's, it's like we're always transmitting something. We're radiating. Yes. What, who we are Mm -hmm. and it's, it's our thoughts and it's our being who we are. Mm -hmm. So you can tell when someone's like, you know, something's they're off, right? Mm -hmm. Cause that vibe is, is like a different frequency (laughs) than it usually is. You say, Hey honey, what's wrong? And they say, Oh, nothing. Yeah. Mm. What do you do in those situations? You know, something's wrong. Yeah. (laughs) I think, geez, I know. I think that people think that women do that a lot. (laughs) What's wrong, honey? Nothing. Don't want to talk about it right now. (laughs) 
<laughs> well, men do it too. It's, it's not just say, one gender. It uh-huh. does go both ways. But I think for me, how do you feel like you handle that when I say nothing and you know that there's something wrong? It, well, here's the thing, right? So mm-hmm. we, we've been married almost 21 years. So let if there's, it's very different now than it was in the beginning. So if we talk about in the beginning, often if I knew something was wrong, I would begin to try to just right then and there, just extract it from her. Yeah. Uh huh. Because shotgun. Right. Exactly. Because exactly. I'm like, you're you're not telling the truth. So what is it? What is it? What is it? What yeah. is it? What is it? And and that just turned it into something that I definitely did not want. Right. And so after several times of like, you know what, this is not the result I'm looking for. So what is the result I'm looking for? Mm -hmm. And then figuring out what is the result I'm looking for and taking some time to actually learn her Mm. and how she communicates and how she likes to be communicated to. Then over the years that changed. So if you ask me that question now, when she says there's nothing wrong and I know in my heart that there's something wrong. Typically, I'm going to say now, okay, she's still in processing mode. And mm-hmm. that's because I know her now. Right. And I know that she's in processing mode. And 10 times out of 10, she comes out of processing mode and starts a conversation. Yeah. In the beginning, I'm just trying to browbeat it out of her and uh-huh. she's getting more and more frustrated and getting more and more closed off. Yeah, shut down even more. So the yeah. time, so so what would have been maybe a day before the conversation now is a month because she don't want to talk to me because I'm just <laughs> too aggressive, yeah. you know. So right. yeah, she digs her heels in more. Right. Exactly. <laughs> really, I do. <laughs> so, so if you're I, on the receiving end of that browbeating, how do you? Um, what's a great way to respond to that? Mm, that's a good question. Oh. If I'm on the receiving end of that, it does make me want to, like you said, dig my heels in even more. Not because I'm trying to be stubborn, but because the confrontation is so uncomfortable for me that it just makes me shut down. Yeah. But if he doesn't come at me that way and he asks me what's wrong and he may ask again, are you sure? At this point in time in our relationship, I may say, you know, I just I can't talk about it right now. Give me a little bit of time to to process how I want to respond, how I want to say what it is that's going on with me, what I'm thinking about, what I'm feeling, what's on my heart. Just give me, you know, X amount of time to to process it in my mind before I present it to you. Whereas before now, I'm not saying nothing is wrong. At least he knows that something's going on, but I'm just unable to talk about it right now. Yeah. And, and I think that's important, too, because. I feel like sometimes we have this misconception about communication and that if I'm going to talk and if I'm going to have a conversation with you, that it it has to be it has to fall under this certain criteria. Mm. Yeah. And so I can't tell you, hey, I don't know what to say right now. So I need some time like that. For some reason, we never felt like that was effective communication, but that's phenomenal communication because it it allows a person to know right then and there what the situation is and how they can approach the situation. Yeah. So for her to tell me, Hey, you know what? I just need a moment. Let me get my thoughts together. I'll come back to you. Boom. The questioning stops. Yeah, exactly. That's good. And you have the decency to accept that. Right. right. Question right. is going to stop for now. Right. Right. Uh, th- th- there's c- popular marriage advice. that says, don't go to, don't go to sleep when if you're still mad at each other or, don't let the sun go down on your wrath or whatever. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Sometimes that's not very helpful advice. Or is it? I don't think that it is. Because, again, if I'm heated to the point where what I say may not come out right or may be offensive, I don't think it's a good time to say that. Or if you're the type of communicator like myself where you need time to process and you need time to think about what it is you're going to say, then I think that not, you know, waiting until it's all resolved may not necessarily be something that's feasible. I think what's a great idea is to say, you know, I'm really upset about this. I just need some time. Can we talk about it in the morning? Because if we talk about it now, the tension is too thick. The emotions are too high. It's just not going to be an effective communication session, I think that we should wait 
I don't have it in me right now to deal with how I'm feeling. Can we talk about it in the morning? Yeah, I I don't think you should go. I don't think you should go to bed without any level of acknowledgement. Yes, exactly. Yes. Now uh-huh. you you may not resolve the the whole thing. Like I don't know right. that that's realistic for every couple. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. I do believe there has to be some level of acknowledgement. Hey, this is where we are. This is where we potentially may like to get to, but mm-hmm. in between now and then, I need to go downstairs and play a video game or I need to go take a bath or I need to just have this moment and then we'll pick it up at this particular moment. And I think that if you're honest about that and just say, you know, I don't have it in me right now. It's not a good time. Our tensions are too high right now. Our emotions are too high. I think even doing that decreases the tension a little bit so that tomorrow you can have a more productive conversation about whatever the situation is. Yeah, and and here's here's what I tell couples. The sooner you get in the habit of of doing that mm-hmm. and being assertive in your communication in that way, mm-hmm. the sooner you get to a place where you can move through the stages of conflict more effectively. Mm-hmm. Cuz con- conflict, let's let's be honest, conflict as it relates to communication, it's never going away. Mm-hmm. Like we're going to disagree about something in the mm-hmm. future, right? How effectively are we able to move through the stages of that? How how effectively are we able to uh, go through the explanation stage of communication and the clarification stage of communication and the negotiation stage, which is mm-hmm. what we're trying to get to so that we can build that playbook that you talked about? I think the the sooner we get comfortable with being assertive in our communication, the, the the quicker we get to a place where we move through those phases effectively. Yeah. Speaking of assertive in the communication, uh, that's hard for some couples. There's the elephant in the room that they just don't want to acknowledge. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And have you had an experience like that in your marriage where there was that like thing that you just kind of avoided <laughs> that you wish, looking back, mm-hmm. wish we would have been a little more direct at attacking it. Or you're always beating around the bush about one thing mm-hmm. instead of like being more direct about it. Yeah. I. <clears throat> what came to my mind was, because we just talked about this recently, was the, is the whole Christmas thing. Mm, very good. <clears throat> and good, so good example. That, that's always been an elephant. So to give you give you some context. Was it a white elephant around Christmas time? That's yeah. a good one. I like it. <laughs> <laughs> I just got to ask. <laughs> that's, that's a good, good one. So so the context, right, is that my, my family. So going back and, and again, you know, communication and the way you handle things, you know. You learned it from your family. Yeah, trace back to your family of origin. So yep. my family is not a very festive. They're not against it totally, but you know, Christmas is just a Tuesday to them. Mm -hmm. Right. And so that's kind of how I grew up. My wife's family, I joke about this all the time. They can celebrate the fact that today is Friday. You know, (laughs) that's the kind of family I want to be. You know, (laughs) let's party today's Sunday, you know? Uh And so when, when we would come (laughs) to the holidays, I kind of have this nonchalant kind of way of how I approached it. And she would always be upset with me, but I never said anything. I never explained where that came from. I just was myself. She was herself. That elephant, like you said, is in between us and Mm -hmm. nobody ever said anything, but we all reacted. Yeah. Yes. Uh We all reacted, but we never said anything. Mm -hmm. Right. And so we're flying off the reaction. We're going off the reaction, but no communication at all. And this went on for years. Yeah. I would go uh-huh. to her family. I would go to her family for the holidays. I'd be that guy that's sitting in the corner. I'm not saying sulking. Anything. Right. I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm eating my food and I'm just like, you know, this is crazy. I, you know, when are we going home kind of thing? Year. Uh-huh. Right. Finally had a conversation. It's like, wait a minute, babe. You know what? Let me, sh- let me just share with you what Christmas was like for me. Mm-hmm. And then to add even more context, the thing that I that I really didn't like about the holidays was that we didn't have a lot of money growing up. Uh-huh. And so I dreaded that first day of school, mm-hmm. January 4, <clears throat> because I'd have to be around my classmates who were like, oh, I got this pair of sneakers. I got this. I got that. And uh-huh. I learned to 
play everything off like, oh, you know what? I didn't really want to spend any money this year. You know, I just, you know, I just a couple of things I needed. So it wasn't really a big deal. And I had to do that every year and get used to doing that. And so it just turned me off to the whole thing. Uh-huh. And after explaining that to her, having that conversation, which we say all the time, anybody who's been around us will know we say these, these three words, have a conversation. conversation. Yeah. Uh-huh. After having that conversation, you want to talk about moving a humongous 90,000 pound elephant out of the room. Mm-hmm. And now us being able to get to that negotiation mm-hmm. phase. Yes. Where uh-huh. you'd be like, okay, I understand that. Okay. So listen, I'm not going to push you as hard as I do when we go to our family. And then me, on the other hand, I'm like, okay, let me get into some games. Let me play. A, I won't play all 45 games, <laughs> uh-huh. but how about we start with two <laughs> and then right. I'll go back and sit down, you know? And so, and so, yeah, that was, that was a big one for us. And now he's the life of the party at my family's <laughs> house. Oh, nice. <laughs> <laughs> that is so good. When we talk to someone, we, it's a lot easier to like express how we're feeling and like to, you know, we want to be understood. But listening, on the other hand, is a completely underrated skill. And they don't teach that enough in school. <laughs> like no. You're right. learning to listen. Yeah. Uh, as, you know, as they say, you have two ears and one mouth. So you should right. listen <laughs> twice reason. as much as you speak. <laughs> Any tips you have on how to improve listening skill? Because that's kind of what's missing, it seems like. In a lot a of lot. Yeah, couples. Yeah, yeah, that's missing time. a lot of the time um, with couples. And that's something that we actually had to learn um, with each other. I know that early on in our relationship, not even necessarily early on, because sometimes, here's a good tip. Sometimes when you learn something and you you know to do better, sometimes you're still going to slip up and fall back into what you've always done. Mm-hmm. So there's that. But I remember having to teach, for lack of a better word, Oliver, to let me speak before you come in and say what it is that you have to say. Because he had had a habit of interrupting me when I was talking. And when, when he used to do that, I used to feel like, well, you can't be listening to what I'm saying. Because Uh you're butting in all the time. So how are you hearing what I'm saying? And we tell this to couples all the time in our seminars. When you're communicating with your spouse, one of the tips for listening well is not to what we call lawyer listen. And if you think about a lawyer when they're in court, in the courtroom, and they're um, listening to what's being said, they only hear a few things because they're getting ready to offer their rebuttal of the yes. few things that was said. And sometimes Oliver used to just hear bits and pieces of the beginning of what I said and not listen to the whole thing. And he would just butt in all the time and not hear the whole thing. And so what we've learned is that we have to completely listen to what the other person is saying without lawyer listening so that you can hear the whole conversation and be able to respond to all of it and not just some of it. Yeah, that's a that's a that's a good one. And that that's one definitely that I I had to uh, I I, I was that guy, man, I'm playing double Dutch, (laughs) you know, trying to jump back into the conversation. And we tell couples often to to get in the habit. Right. Because you like, how do you do that from a practical standpoint? If you're if you're that person like me who is always jumping in, what can you do to to stop doing that? Right. And so for me, what I had to do was. In those times when I had the urge to jump in with a complete statement, if I said anything at all, it would just be to acknowledge what she said. So so, if, so far. Right. So if she said a statement to me and I'd say, oh, OK. And now, you know, cognitively, my brain uh-huh. knows I said something, <laughs> you know, yes. and I and I had to do that. And then kind of morph that into the active listening piece, but not not just acknowledging. But then after she was done, instead of jumping again back into whatever my rebuttal was, taking a moment to ask her by repeating what she said. So what, so what I'm hearing you say yeah. is or is, is this what you're saying to me that such and such and such and such and and actually repeating what she said, mm-hmm. which I which I'm going to tell you, Dan, in the beginning. <laughs> and couples laugh at me when I say this to them. In the beginning, I thought it was the most ridiculous thing ever. Why should I have to repeat back to you 
what you said. <laughs> right, exactly. Uh huh. You said it. So, uh huh. You know, but but what it does, what it does, you, we talked about explanation, clarification, and, and negotiation. What it does is open that door for additional explanation or clarification. Yeah. And sometimes that additional explanation or clarification is the thing that keeps you from have it, it it's the difference between continuing on in a productive conversation or uh getting off the exit of conflict. Yeah. And so after learning that like man if I just ask her a couple questions we can kind of get through this whole thing without it becoming a, a huge deal. And so after learning that over time I was like ah okay let me play to the end game. I don't want conflict. I don't want this to end to in into an argument. So what do I have to not do? I have to not interrupt. Not yeah. What do I have to do? I need to ask a question. I need to acknowledge, you know, and so that's that's kind of how that played out for us. Mm-hmm. I uh recently reread Seven Habits of Highly Effective People by Dr. Stephen R. Covey. Mm-hmm. He talks about that very thing you're talking about. It's but one thing he added that I picked up this time that I that I really liked is it's not just being a parrot and repeating back what they're saying. There's the head component and there's the heart component and mm-hmm. you need both. Yeah. So it's, it's you're, you're stating again in your own words, what they said, but you're putting your heart into it mm-hmm. because you want to understand yeah. where they're coming from. Yeah. Right. You're, you sincerely do. And when yeah. you do, then things can really go to the next level with, with understanding another person. Right. Yep. So. Yeah. Yep. And that that's a great point too, because in the beginning, I'll be honest, in the beginning, it is very it was very mechanical for yeah. me. Uh-huh. It was okay, I need to do these steps, A, step yes. B, step C, so that we don't <laughs> this doesn't blow up. Mm-hmm. Right. And then and then getting to that point, getting past that mechanical point where, like you said, where the heart component is in there, I am genuinely trying to understand what it is you have to say to me. Mm -hmm. I genuinely don't want this to become something that it should not become. Yeah. And so what, what is my contribution to that? Yeah. Excellent. That's Mm -hmm. fantastic. Okay. This podcast is really dedicated to improving intimacy in marriage. And we talk a lot about sexual intimacy. Mm -hmm. How do all these things that we talked about today with all these communication skills translate to to uh, sex in the bedroom because really sex is a form of communication. It's, it's a, it's a language. Yeah. It's a great language to express love and whatever. Mm-hmm. What are your thoughts on translating these different skills to the bedroom? Oh gosh. I, I it's super important. I yeah. would say, I know that that is something that we struggled with early on and um, just coming from my background, when, when we met, I was a single parent. And so in my previous relationship, the sexual intimacy was not great. And I never talked about that with Oliver. And so that caused a huge, I would say, barrier with us in the beginning, because there were certain issues that would arise. And there was certain ways in which I was uncomfortable, but I never told him why. And so there was that barrier of him almost saying to me, girl, what is wrong with you? And me not saying anything until, you know, and that, that caused conflict all the time, all the time. It was either there was a conflict because of our intimacy time, or there was no intimacy time all because I did not communicate with him about my previous relationship and the discomfort surrounding all of that. And it wasn't until I would say literally years later where I had the conversation, just like the Christmas story and told Uh him, you know, this is why I react the way I do, or this is why I don't react at all is because of X, Y, Z. And ever since then, you know, our intimacy time, it completely turned around but it wasn't until I had the conversation with him. So communication is so, so, so super important. And it does make you more, it does help you to connect on a deeper level when the communication is open and when both both of you are sharing intimately the way that you should. Yeah, it's, if there's, I mean, there's nothing in marriage we've learned that you need, that you should leave 
for chance. Yeah. Right. There's nothing you should take for granted. There's nothing that you should just leave to chance. Mm-hmm. And if there's anything you shouldn't be guessing about, mm-hmm. <laughs> it is your sexual intimacy. Right. Mm-hmm. And so it, it's amazing how many of us uh, just expect something to be built without a blueprint. Yeah. Yeah. We just expect our intimacy to just grow and grow and grow, happen. but we're yeah. just we're not putting anything into it in the in the way of blueprint. We're not explaining, we're not clarifying, we're not mm-hmm. asking questions, we're not being forthcoming and being vulnerable in that space mm-hmm. and talking about certain things and then we wonder why are we hitting a brick wall in certain areas. And so that's something we had to learn. Yeah. Hey, there's there is a level of blueprint here. What is it that you like? What is it that you expect? What is it that you don't like? What is it that you are apprehensive about and why? And, you know, not just maybe, and sometimes we don't get to the why, right? We stand on our position. This is never going to happen. Okay. But what's why? the backstory? Yeah. Because the backstory is what connects us. The backstory is what allows me to have some compassion. Mm-hmm. The backstory is what allows me to care more, which in and of itself builds intimacy outside of the bedroom because now we're being vulnerable. Now there's that emotional component that's coming in because we're able to say something as opposed to just allowing it to, you know, do whatever it does organically, which often leads to nothing being done. Yeah. Mm. I want to double click on something you said, uh, Denise, backing up. So you had this issue in your, in your, uh, in, with intimacy, something that bothered you, it, it took a while, and then finally you you broke the silence and you you talked about it, mm-hmm. and that cleared up a lot of things. But the way you approached that, mm-hmm. I think, is remarkable. It seems like you didn't make it like an accusation, or you didn't point your finger at him, or anything like that. You you, you owned it. I did. It seemed to come like from like you referenced it from yourself. Like yeah. this is my issue that I'm dealing with. Yeah. And how I how th- many couples do you think could use that? Like, because uh, in the, if there's intimacy issues, it's so easy to point your finger oh, absolutely. Yeah. away from you. Yeah. yeah. But you, you didn't, you kind of took responsibility for that. Yeah. I did take responsibility for it. And it's funny because even before, before I talked about it, the whole, every time that I felt uncomfortable enough to the point where I didn't want to do anything sexually with Oliver. I did make it feel like it was just him. Oh, you just want it all the time. You know, you just want sex all the time. You know, oh, it's easier to make it all about them because <laughs> I don't have to change. I don't have to do any of the changing. Exactly. You do all the changing. Exactly. But you know, it'd be so convenient. Everyone else in the world just changed for my benefit. <laughs> I didn't have to do any growing myself. Right. <laughs> right. And I think that's where a lot of couples struggle is in that, should I own it or should I deflect? Should I own it or should I deflect? And I was just like, man, we've been been on this hamster wheel for the longest time and nothing is changing. I'm deflecting and making him feel bad for something that's natural and I'm not changing and he's not changing and I should be the one that's changing because I'm the one with the issue. And so that is where I just was like, you know, I have to own it because this hamster wheel is making me tired, honestly. And so, you know, I just had to own it. And that's where the change came in. You have to own your stuff. Yeah, it's it's interesting, too, because we we tell couples because it, the, the finger pointing is re- very easy. Mm-hmm. And often mm-hmm. we ask couples, OK, what is it that you need to do? in order to see this relationship thrive. And they're like, yeah. Well, and you're not saying to the, to like the couple, you're saying it to the individual, the individual. in the, in the right. couple, right? Like yeah. husband, and what do right. you need to do? What Wife, do what do, do you need to do? Right. And it's funny because they'll, they'll look at me strange and be like, that's not what we're talking about. We're not, no, talking it's about his you. problem. No, it's her problem. We're talking about her. <laughs> You know, and I'm not the one with the problem. <laughs> right. And, and, and we'll let them know, Hey, listen, I, I hear you. I hear you that you see that there's some, some need there. Mm -hmm. We'll come back to that. Let's start here. Mm -hmm. What is your contribution? What are, what are some of the things that you can do? What are some of the adjustments that you can make? What are the, some of the things that you can own? Like, like Nisi said, 
that will allow the needle to move. Yeah. Right. And, and once you do that, once you are that bigger person, or once you are that person who makes the first move as it relates to communicating and sharing, you'll be surprised Mm. how the, the tension comes down, the walls, if you will, come down. And you're like, man, Uh why didn't I do that? six months ago right. we would have been somewhere different right now yeah you know and and just and just taking the opportunity to just take that first step is, is crucial and i mean it is difficult i mean i was this way for years and it's very difficult to be vulnerable because it's something that i had never shared with him before i don't know how he's gonna i mean i know him for the most part so i know uh-huh. Pretty much how he's going. But it's still to scary. That. But it's still scary. There's still uh-huh. that fear there. Vulnerability is a very scary thing. It is. And it so is. I think I just got to the point where I was like, if I want better, I have to do something different. If you want to see some, if you want to see different results, you can't com- you gotta, yeah. continue with the insanity. And here's the flip side of that. Let me give. Let me give a, a communication hack, if you will. Right. All right. Let's hear it. So. So, yes, she had to own it. She had to make the first move. She had to be forthcoming and assertive in her communication. Right. But for the other person, for me, for the person who's on the other side of that. Here's a phenomenal hack. Start creating the atmosphere. Yeah, for sure. Start setting up a safety net. Mm hmm. Start making them feel comfortable. Start meeting, you know, looking at meeting their needs, whatever those needs are. Start creating that environment where they can feel comfortable. You know, you may do that for days and may not see a result. Mm -hmm. But believe me, you're you are you are building something that they can walk into, look around and be like, oh, this is this is what I needed to to do what I to say what I needed to say. Yes. So begin to do that. Even if you don't see that happening right now, Mm. take the initiative, begin to create the atmosphere that is a safety net, that is a safe haven, that is a space where once they get to that space, Mm -hmm. they're like, oh, yeah, okay. I feel comfortable here. We can, I feel we can safe talk. here. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's not an overnight thing. It comes it from not. daily little bits at a time. That's why I'm a big favor of the daily intimacy challenges in the Intimately Us app, for instance. Yes. Indeed. I don't care if you do them or do the exact suggestion or not, but it's the idea that every day I'm going to do something to move the needle a little bit yep. mm-hmm. to create a better relationship, create a better environment. Yep, that's what because it's all about. He, because he definitely was not doing that in the beginning. And the he, he would come at me with this confrontational spirit. And, uh-huh. you know, that's just not going to help my situation at all. I don't feel comfortable enough to be vulnerable when you're being confrontational. I feel like you're, you know, looking down at me and wagging your finger and yelling at me. And that doesn't make me feel like I want to be vulnerable at all. And so little by little, he backed off of that. And, you know, I felt like he was really trying to put me into a space where I felt comfortable enough to be vulnerable. And if he didn't do that, I would not be able to own it. Yeah. There's some, there's some forward thinking, I guess you would say that has to come into play. Right. And Mm -hmm. For me and what what I share with couples often is what I what I ended up having to do was I had to step back for a second and say, what is the end result? What is it that I want? Right. I want us to have productive conversation. I want our sex life to be great. I want to I want her to be happy. I want to see her smiling and laughing. Mm -hmm. I, I want her to have this, you know, carefree nature. I don't want her to feel like she has to have her guard up and that every time I come at her, you know, it, she has to put on some level of armor. Mm, so right. I'm, I'm creating this house, if you will. So if you think about building a house, you go look at these models like this is the one. Mm. OK, so if this is the one, what all has to be done now in order to create to that? Get that? Yeah. Yeah. And then I had to back, you know, reverse engineer and be like, OK, what do I need to do to get to that end result? And that's when I started putting those pieces in place. Okay, you need to stop talking. 
You know, sometimes, and listening more. Sometimes, right. Sometimes <laughs> yeah. great communication is to stop talking. Yeah. And actually listen. Mm. I need to begin to, you know, allow her to feel safe. Yeah. And and when I approach her, I have to choose my tone and and watch my timing and check the temperature of the of the scenario and of the space so that I'm now approaching her in a way that doesn't cause her to automatically put on boxing gloves or body armor Mm -hmm. that she's actually open to what I'm saying and is is now open to uh, reciprocating. Yeah. Great. I want to close our interview today by asking one more question regards to uh, a spiritual connection in your marriage. What are ways uh, couples communicate with God and bring God in in because there are some problems we can probably solve on our own and other ones where we really need heaven's help. Mm-hmm. What are ways you do that together as a couple to help uh, build that intimacy? Oh, prayer for sure. Um, yeah. What we, we don't do it every day, but we are very, very intentional about praying in the morning and in the evening and sometimes during the day, especially if we have something going on that we need, you know, guidance for, um, Prayer is definitely the way that we connect and make sure that we're on the same page and make sure we're going in the direction that God wants us to go. Yeah, that's I would say for couples. The starting point, right, because there's so many things that you can do as you grow spiritually. Right. The starting point, I would say, is have a time where you pray together. Yeah. And just start where you are. That's what Mm -hmm. we told a couple the other day. Start where you are. It may not be this long, drawn out prayer for, you know, 45 minutes. Mm -hmm. It may be a two, three, four minute prayer where you guys get together. You may read something together, have, Mm -hmm. you know, some type of devotion. Um, Because what you're looking for is the common goal, right? The common goal is that you're as you, you know, you've seen the triangle, right? So they're like, as you get closer to God, you you ultimately get closer to each other. And that's the goal, right? Mm -hmm. And so. How do you do that? Communicate with God through prayer mm-hmm. together and and you you'll see some of that spill over into your communication because often we'll pray about something and talk about it afterward. Yeah. Whereas we might have not had that conversation. Right. Had it not been for the prayer that was prayed prior. Yeah. Excellent. Well, thank you very much. Thanks for all the wisdom and being generous with sharing your experience with with me and uh, with everyone today. Thank you. Thank you. We appreciate it. It's our honor to be a guest. Thank you. Yeah, really. For those that want to learn more about you and what you do, what's the best way for them to reach you? Best way would be to go to the website, which is Denali, D-E-N-O-L-I dot org. From there, You get everything, podcasts, YouTube, social media. That's Mm -hmm. the hub. And Denali is Denise and Oliver. Those two names smushed together. Den Ollie. That's correct. Exactly. (laughs) (laughs) Very clever. (laughs) Thank you. (laughs) We hope that you enjoyed this episode of Get Your Marriage On. And if you did, we would love it if you would take a few seconds to give us a rating on iTunes and to share the show with your friends. They'll thank you for life. Once you've done that, you can head over to GetYourMarriageOn.com for more resources about today's topic and to download our amazing marriage apps. Now go get your marriage on.